For billions of years, countless species have been sending information back and forth. Vast networks of messages designed to defend against predators, acquire mates, and obtain food. There is a staggering diversity of ways in which animals can communicate. From microscopic bacteria to the largest animals on Earth, the ability to relay information has often determined a species' very survival. This is the story of communication. Survival of the fittest. That basic tenet of evolution implies that in the animal kingdom, it's every creature for itself. To ensure their own survival, animals rely on a vast array of communication methods. Visual, chemical, vocal, and gestured. How effectively animals communicate can mean the difference between life and death. These researchers are investigating the lines of communication between prey and their predators. In this experiment, a snake is given a choice between two frogs. Which will it eat? The message of the poison dart frog is loud and clear. My bright, colorful skin is toxic. I am a deadly meal. The other frog isn't communicating anything at all. For most animals, finding food, reproducing, and living in social groups is totally dependent on the ability to share information, to communicate. And our world today is entirely dependent on organized flow of information. But humans aren't the only species whose lofty status in the natural world is owed to its powers of communication. Communication was also the evolutionary engine for creatures that first appeared 150 million years ago, a type of insect that would ultimately become one of the most numerous organisms on the face of the Earth, ants. There are a lot of ants in the world. If you took all the land animals and put them on a scale together and weighed it, 20% of what you just weighed would be the big pile of ants sitting on the scale. But what can explain how such small, defenseless creatures became such evolutionary giants? Deborah Gordon and her colleague Mike Green have spent years investigating the collective power of ants. What continues to fascinate me about ants is how such limited, apparently inept individuals in the aggregate can do such amazing things. Few creatures work as tirelessly or cooperatively as ants. Their intricate nests are like mini cities, measuring meters in width and depth. Their engineering feats appear to be the results of rigid organization. But how do they stay organized, and how do they communicate? At first glance, an ant colony resembles a human construction site, where workers carry out specific tasks. The ant world features the same specialization. There are patrollers who search for food and foragers who harvest food once it's found. And the cleanup crew who sweep the nest for dead ants. But whereas a human construction site has a foreman issuing verbal, written, or gestured orders, ants have no chain of command. In fact, Ants display no visible sign of being able to communicate at all. How do ants know what to do? An ant colony operates without any central control, no management, no hierarchy, nobody deciding what needs to be done. The source of communication turns out to be simple chemicals that cover the body of the ant. Hydrocarbons, 
A hydrocarbon is just a type of molecule that's made up of carbons and hydrogens. They're commonly found on the surface of not only ants, but all kinds of insects, especially social insects. Hydrocarbons emit an odor, and many social insects use them to communicate a very basic piece of information. Are you one of us or one of them? Most ants can't see. Their main form of perceiving the world around them is smell, and they smell with their antennae. When an ant touches another ant with its antennae, it can tell if the other ant is a nest mate. We can actually test that nest mate recognition response using a, a glass block. When a glass block covered with hydrocarbons from a rival colony is introduced to the nest, right the ants immediately attack. Those ants are biting the block right now. Yeah, they are. Could ants also use hydrocarbons to communicate more complex information? Signals that might tell them what jobs to do? When Green isolated the hydrocarbons from the surface of different ants, he discovered that each job had a different scent. This discovery led them to design an experiment to see if it was possible to communicate with ants. Could you compel ants to do a job simply by using hydrocarbons alone? Gordon and Green created mimic ants by coating glass beads with the hydrocarbons of patroller ants, the ants whose job it is to scout for food. Would these hydrocarbons communicate a message? Each morning, the patrollers come out and search the foraging area, and the foragers won't come out until the patrollers come back. The patrollers need to come back at a certain rate to stimulate the foragers to go out. And by using these beads, we can mimic the rate at which patrollers come back. When beads are dropped into the nest, the hydrocarbon scent communicates that the beads are returning patroller ants and that it's time for these unemployed ants to take up a new job. Go get the food the patrollers had found. It's not as though one ant gives another ant a message. It's that each ant can use its recent experience of interactions to decide what to do. So the message is in the pattern of interactions, not in any particular signal. With this simple experiment, the researchers found that the mode of communication responsible for ants' ability to work together with such astounding precision is little more than a simple set of chemicals relaying information. What's remarkable, they're interacting with each other in a really pretty simple way, but because the ants can assess the rate at which they interact with other workers, Global changes can happen within their society, despite the fact there's no boss assessing all of this and telling each worker what to do. This mode of communication has helped ants thrive for 150 million years. An ant colony would be unable to survive if individuals didn't communicate with each other. For ants, the ongoing, very simple, repeated patterns of interaction are what sustains the whole life of the colony. Ants have used communication to become some of the most successful creatures on Earth. But how did the process of communication first start? Which species first relayed information to each other? Does a huge, mysterious glow in the ocean seen for hundreds of years hold the answer? Over the eons, Chemical, visual, and vocal forms of communication have evolved over and over, helping animals to flourish in virtually every environment on the planet. How did this astonishing process of relaying information begin? A strange occurrence in the ocean may shed light on the very first communication. Not long ago, Orbiting satellites picked up a strange glow in the sea off the Horn of Africa. Tens of thousands of square miles of ocean, an area the size of Connecticut, was lit up. It was a phenomenon known as Milky Seas. Similar occurrences had been witnessed for centuries, but with no explanation. If you read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or other sort of seagoing novels, there'll be some very accurate descriptions of Milky Seas that the characters in the book have experienced. 
The source of the Milky Sea was revealed to be bioluminescent bacteria, a species of tiny microbes found at sea. Why were trillions of marine bacteria lighting up all at once? Molecular biologists investigated the phenomenon and made an amazing discovery. Bacteria talk to each other. Bacteria do communicate. They obviously don't have words like we do. What they use for their words are chemicals. So they exchange chemicals as their language, and it allows them to do different things. Molecular biologist Bonnie Bassler studies how individual bacterium release chemical molecules to signal their presence to other bacteria. As they're growing and dividing, they're making and releasing small molecules that you can just think of like hormones or pheromones. And when the molecules hit a particular amount, all the bacteria would recognize those molecules were there. It would tell them about how many neighbors they would have. And then they would all turn on light in synchrony. Bioluminescent microbes are but one of millions of different bacterial strains that communicate this way. How do they do it? Bacteria often act like a legislative body. Wilson of Ohio. To achieve anything important, they need to work as a group. And to do this, they first need a quorum, the presence of a critical number of individuals that emit molecules to each other. So we call this phenomenon quorum sensing. The bacteria vote with these little chemical votes. They count the vote, and then the entire group acts together. But what would a single-cell bacterium, an organism that reproduces all by itself, need to communicate? They need communication because they need to be able to carry out tasks that are too hard for the individual. They need it exactly the same way we often need to get groups together to accomplish things that we just couldn't do by ourselves because they're too hard. Some bacteria communicate to find each other so they can hunt together. Others communicate to launch collective attacks on our bodies. And these bacteria off the coast of Africa turn bioluminescent in the ocean. One bacteria makes a little bit of light that's not gonna be perceived, but if they all glow together, you get perceivable light. So what are bioluminescent bacteria trying to communicate? Incredibly, while many creatures use communication to avoid their predators, these bacteria are lighting up to attract fish to eat them. In the case of bacteria, they actually live inside the guts of other animals. So for them to be eaten by a fish is actually a favorable thing. They want to be in that intestinal environment. When they get together in these colonies, they produce a glow, and some fish will be attracted to that light and come along and eat it. The product of the Earth's most primitive organisms, milky seas are believed to be a remnant of the planet's very first communication. But for Bassler, talking bacteria are about far more than bioluminescence. The way they communicate reveals how cells, the building blocks of complex life, first came together. Bacteria, because they have chemical communication, we think that they invented the way that groups of organisms or cells work together to do things cooperatively. Such cooperation among cells is what creates and maintains the organs that run our complex bodies. The mechanisms bacteria use to do this chemical communication are very analogous to the strategies used by the different cells in your body to make groups and to carry out particular tasks, like your kidney cells and your heart cells and your muscle cells. In the billions of years since bacteria first relayed information, life forms have become more complex. And the process of chemical communication has been refined and manipulated by a variety of different species, all with the same purpose, survival. These California ground squirrels use chemical scents that they secrete to mark their territory. But by doing so, squirrels unwittingly communicate their whereabouts to their chief predator, the rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes have an amazing sense of smell that they use to hunt their prey. Yeah. 
As ground squirrels are moving through their environment or in their burrows, they're inadvertently communicating with the rattlesnake, leaving behind olfactory cues, which the rattlesnake can use to locate them. Biologist Barbara Klukas has long studied the relationship between these two rivals. She knew that for rattlesnakes, the scent trail left behind by squirrels was like having GPS directions right to their burrows. So how could squirrels possibly survive and thrive when their main predator had turned their own communication system against them? Klukas wondered whether the answer lay with a curious behavior she had witnessed in the wild squirrels chewing on shed rattlesnake skins. There you go. So he's going to start chewing on it. It's kind of a sticky paste if you get it wet, the shed skin. Then they'll sort of lick their flank a bit, and then they'll move to their tail. To Klukas, this observation was a revelation. Squirrels were trying to cloak themselves in the scent of their enemy a form of deceptive communication. But were the snakes falling for the trick? We had an idea that the snakes and applications served an anti-predator function, but we wanted to directly ask the predator to see if it was affected by adding rattlesnake to squirrel scent. Using snake skins and squirrel fur she collected in the field, Klukas prepared two samples, one marked strictly with squirrel scent, and another with a combination of both snake and squirrel scents, mimicking the result of the squirrel's cloaking tactic. In the wild, they're not completely covering all their odor, so it's gonna be a mixture of ground squirrel odor and rattlesnake odor. Klukas was then ready for her subject, one of the deadliest snakes in the world, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. Snakes pick up scents differently than mammals. They smell with their tongue, using its forked shape to direct air molecules toward a sensory organ on the roof of their mouths. For Klukas, the frequency and speed with which the snake flicked its tongue would let her know if it had locked onto the squirrel's scent. What I would score is the amount of time the snake would have its head over the filter paper and then also the number of tongue flicks that they did over the filter paper. The squirrel only scent clearly got the snake's attention. See how his tongue flicks changes? They go faster. Yeah, he's definitely interested in that. <laughs> but the sample cloaked in rattlesnake scent tempered its aggression. A series of slower, longer tongue flicks for Klukas, this meant only one thing. The snake scent was masking the squirrel scent. Prey had deceived predator using chemical communication. The snake was led to think it was pursuing not a squirrel, but another snake. By testing the snakes directly, I could see that their hunting behavior was, in fact, affected by adding rattlesnake odor to ground squirrel odor, and therefore, reduces the predation risk for the ground squirrels. Billions of years after it was invented, ground squirrels have advanced chemical communication, using it to outwit their predators and ensure their own survival. Communication is the basis of predator-prey interactions. And ground squirrels, by applying snake scent to their body, are manipulating this communication and gaining a major advantage over rattlesnakes. Scent and chemical communication provides insects, mammals, and other animals with a fast, effective means of sending a message. But for some animals in the ocean, a different strategy for communicating turned out to be the most effective. For sending instructions or evading predators, chemical communication can be key. But such subtle messages can get lost in the shifting currents of the Big Blue Sea. For long-range communication, some animals evolved a more powerful way of getting their message across. Sound. Each year in Cape Coral, Florida, residents encounter an unexplained phenomena. 
a deep series of sounds rattle the walls of their canal side homes. It would be like dum, 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 all through the house. For years, the source remained a mystery. Until word reached David Mann, an oceanographer at the University of South Florida. We heard through the grapevine that people were hearing these strange sounds at night in their houses. One of my grad students, Jim Lacasio, actually went down to the city council meeting and said, I know what it is. I can tell you what it is. One night, Lacasio took his research boat down to Cape Coral to confirm his hunch. He brought with him one instrument, a waterproof microphone, the perfect tool to pinpoint the surprising source. Come out on the water and it's a peaceful night. It's quiet. We really don't hear anything except the gentle rocking of the waves. But if we put a hydrophone under the surface of the water and we use a simple handheld speaker, we experience an entirely different landscape. The culprit Locasio discovered was a fish, one with an apt name, the black drum. Locasio had long known male drumfish to be some of the loudest creatures in the sea. He also knew they didn't make that noise for the sake of it. They were communicating with one another. These are all males advertising themselves to females that will ultimately choose who they mate with. For a male drum, being loud increases their chance of passing on their genes. The males are making the sound going boom, 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 to attract females, and they like to do that between 7 and 2 AM, just when people are trying to go to bed. So the sounds are so loud, they travel right through the seawall, up into the house. It's amazing. You can go out into the driveway of these houses, put your head down, and hear the sound of the fish coming from 100 yards away. But why is sound such a powerful channel of communication in the ocean? Here, light is in short supply. Chemicals quickly dissipate. But for sound, water acts as the ultimate conductor. Sonic signals pass between the dense molecules of water like an electric current, traveling farther and five times faster than on land. Sound for animals that live underwater travels great distances and weakens very little over those distances. And so it's no surprise to learn that many marine animals rely on sound as a communication channel. Scientists have long known fish to make all manner of noise, from clicks to chirps to croaks. It's likely that their common ancestors, the first fish who evolved 500 million years ago, couldn't produce such sounds. But then fish evolved organs that would allow some of them to be master communicators. As fish evolved, they evolved a swim bladder, which is an air bladder that's inside their stomach that they use to maintain buoyancy. Fish initially used this adaptation solely for hovering in the water column. But over time, it evolved into the instrument that would give drumfish their name. They've evolved these special muscles that twitch extremely rapidly. They're the fastest known twitching muscles in the vertebrate world. And they basically contract their muscles together and beat the swim bladder like a drum. This adaptation would help the male drumfish attract mates. But while the volume of many fish calls is considerable, they can't rival those of another order of marine life that emerged 50 million years ago. The most powerful communicators in the sea, whales. Not only are whales the Earth's largest animals, they're also the loudest. Their ghostly songs resonate throughout the oceans and can exceed the decibel level of a supersonic jet engine. How and why have whales developed such an ear-splitting method of communication? What do whales communicate to each other? And how has it played a role in these enormous animals' survival? 
It's the beginning of the 21st century, and we've only really just been listening to the ocean on a proper scale for less than a decade. So we're in the early stages of discovering what is actually going on with the communication system of whales. Wide ranging and few in number, whales have been elusive research subjects. But Chris Clark, a bioacoustics expert at Cornell, wondered if he might be able to decipher the messages in whale communication. From here up is already connected. But in order to do that, he had to figure out a way to track them. Collaborating with other marine research groups, he devised a way to eavesdrop on whale conversation. We've designed and developed these auto detection buoys so we can get information back rapidly over the satellite system. We also distribute a network of bottom units, these pop-ups, that collect data continuously. The pop-ups are positioned to capture every whale call within a 300-mile radius off the New England coast. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Once the pop-ups are retrieved, the recordings are sent to Clark's lab at Cornell. He and his team are then able to use whales' calls to precisely map their movements. So we acoustically locate the animal using the known positions and the speed of sound and measuring the time differences, we can actually position the animal in the bay. For years, scientists believed whales were loners, rarely interacting with other members of their species. But the acoustic maps pointed Clark towards a surprising discovery. So here are two whales that are countercalling back and forth and they're gonna join up. They join up, move, then split up. One goes to the east, one goes down here, joins up with another whale. This one goes up here, joins with another whale. So there's this constant chatter back and forth of everybody's checking in and calling and then joining up. Clark's data reveals that these whales are actually social animals that travel in loose-knit groups to share food and find available mates. But unlike other social creatures that live and travel in close proximity, whales traverse huge swaths of open water. If you look at these animals from a satellite and you watch them over time, you see them moving as a cohesive body of individuals, it's an acoustic herd. And the herd is spread over 100,000 square miles. To communicate over these large distances, whales develop powerful low-frequency calls. With the right conditions, the base notes of some whales can traverse entire oceans. I can hear a whale that's singing off of the coast of Canada when I'm in Puerto Rico. The voice is so low and radiates through the ocean so efficiently that it travels almost as though it's a, a laser. It just travels very, very efficiently in the ocean. For millions of years, these giant animals have used this channel of communication to ensure their survival. But as it turns out, another group of titans is now operating on this same frequency ships. Most of the time, you just hear this fog, this noise. It's, it's indescribable. It's just sort of there. And it's been increasing, doubling in size every 10 years. Human hunting has driven many whale species to the brink of extinction. Clark now wonders whether human noise will eventually push them over the edge. If I only have a chance to communicate with you one out of 10 times, how do I tell you where the food is? How do I tell you whether I'm a high quality male? I evolved to communicate over this scale and now I'm forced, not because of anything else other than noise, to live in that world. Our continued disruption of whale communication appears inevitable. Only time will tell whether the world's largest animals can evolve to overcome this challenge. Whales would use sound to conquer the ocean, but on land, animals would need special equipment to ensure their survival. They are
are one of the most successful and feared predators on the face of the Earth. Wolves. For millions of years, the wolf has lived in packs, subscribing to the old adage, strength in numbers, to ensure their survival. But with individual wolves patrolling large stretches of land in search of food, the pack relies on one thing to keep it together, vocal communication. Wolf howls can travel up to six miles and help inform other pack members where everyone is. A pack of wolves is a team working to hunt. Wolves will howl in order to find each other. So if an individual has left the pack for some time and is trying to find the rest of them, that individual will howl and will get a response and that way can find the pack. Wolves even use howling as a form of defense to appear more powerful than they are. Wolves as a group, as, as packs around the den site, have group howls to communicate to neighboring packs. Hey, we're here and listen to how big we are. Wolf howls and every mammal cry have a 350 million year history that began when ancient creatures called tetrapods first moved from water to land. It turns out that sound travels a lot better in water than on land. And so when animals moved onto land, they had to develop a whole new audio toolkit and new ways of producing sound. Life on land demanded new audio equipment, an amplifier. What evolved in many animals was a voice box or larynx, an organ with membranes that vibrate, making noise when air is pushed through them. Voice boxes allowed land dwellers to communicate by projecting sound waves through the air. A voice box would develop in almost all land animals, including humans. Wolves would use this new communication equipment to help make them stronger predators. But it would be one species' desire to reproduce that would drive it to develop a voice box more advanced than any other on the planet. Birds. Each spring in woods everywhere, male songbirds begin singing in an attempt to woo females. To succeed, they need a method of communication that can penetrate dense forest. One of the benefits of using sound over using visual signal, especially in an area like this where visual signals quickly get blocked by trees or leaves or other things, is that sound can permeate throughout an area in a very three-dimensional kind of way. The key to bird communication lies in its incredibly sophisticated voice box. Unlike the single larynx in wolves and humans, Songbirds have two that sit just above their lungs. This innovation, called a syrinx, allows wrens and other birds to modulate different notes at the same time. This helps them use vocal communication to penetrate the dense forest and find mates. And they can produce different frequencies with the left side and the right side simultaneously. Which is something that humans just can't do. Birdsong has evolved to convey one main message, come mate with me. Far more sophisticated communication systems have evolved in chimps, whales, and dolphins. But new research suggests that there is one animal that may have surpassed every other mammal, except us, in language skills. It's a tiny, nearly defenseless rodent, the common prairie dog. The language-like properties of prairie dogs are probably the most sophisticated animal language that has been described to date. Khan Slobodzikov of Northern Arizona University has been decoding prairie dog chirps for 20 years. They can describe the coat color of a coyote. They can describe the size and shape of the coyote. They can describe the speed of travel of the coyote. It's a tonal language system, kind of like Chinese and some of the Native American languages, where changing the tones changes the meaning. Can these simple-looking creatures really be using highly sophisticated communication? 
there are hints that prairie dogs are surprisingly intelligent. They live in massive communities with underground tunnels that can stretch for miles. Prairie dog towns are kind of like medieval cities, where there are marauders coming in, robbers coming in. And like in a medieval city, there are sentinel animals that are watching for predators. Prairie dogs have many predators to fear, and they respond to each in different ways. Here's a call for a hawk. Usually, it's a single chirp. When the alarm goes up for a hawk, the prairie dog stands bolt upright. This is the call for a coyote. The call for a distant coyote sends them scurrying to the edge of their burrows. And a nearby coyote alarm sends them underground. The calls are crucial to survival. Get the call wrong, and the prairie dogs get eaten. The calls sound similar, but as with Chinese and other tonal languages, tiny differences in tone convey big changes in meaning. With some practice, we can hear the difference after maybe about two or three days. So we hear an alarm call, and everybody looks around and says, where's the coyote? Over the years, Slobodzikov and his team compiled a dictionary of prairie dog by simulating different predator attacks and recording the calls. In the lab, the sound waves of individual barks are converted into visual graphics. The call itself is a very complex acoustic waveform, and this is simply a pictorial representation. When these graphics are analyzed by specialized software, the team watched the few calls they recognize explode into an entire prairie dog vocabulary. Some of the calls I call adjective-like calls. Patricia wears a blue jumpsuit, and she goes walking in the prairie dog colony, and the prairie dogs call in response to her wearing the blue jumpsuit. And then she changes into a white jumpsuit, and the prairie dogs call to her in response to the white jumpsuit. The patterns on the screen look the same, but to the trained eye, the subtle variations make all the difference. Here's the call for the blue jumpsuit. It is a typical human call, but there is a trailing edge which denotes the color blue. And here is a white jumpsuit, again, a typical human call, but it's got a buzz on the upper and the lower part. So this part codes for white here, and this part codes for blue here. Khan Slobodzikov is now working to see if prairie dogs are born with their language-like ability, or if they are taught their calls, like humans learning words. If they are, it will be hard to deny that prairie dog is a true animal language. So all along, animals have been talking behind our backs. Could it be that the origins of human language are shared with our closest relatives? Our ancestors managed to invent the most sophisticated form of communication on Earth. Language in many ways defines what it is to be human. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Language has evolved exceptionally rapidly within humans. And so human language is probably the key innovation that has allowed humans to spread so rapidly across the globe and to dominate the planet ecologically. Just where did human language come from? How did we make the leap from the seemingly simple noises made by other animals to precise words that form the most complex method of communication on the planet? From fossils, paleontologists know that our ancestors branched off from apes about five million years ago. 
but precisely when our ancestors first evolved the capacity for language remains one of evolution's greatest mysteries. I think it's important to remember that like lots of other things in the natural world, human language evolved. It didn't just arise. It was selected for over evolutionary time, and the parts of our brain that are involved in language were also selected for. Searching for the elusive roots of human language led neuroscientist Jared Tagliolatella to take a radical approach. He wondered if the brains of our closest living relatives might reveal a clue as to how our language evolved. From the genetic evidence, we know that chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor some five million years ago. But what we don't know is really what chimpanzees and humans have in common when it comes to communication. Having worked with chimps for years, Taglia Latella knew they communicated in a human-like manner. Chimpanzees use sounds, what we call vocalizations. They also use gestures, which they can make with their hands by actually extending hand out or even touching another individual. They'll make different faces to express either something they want to accomplish or in response to what another individual has done. So in some ways, chimpanzee communication is really similar to human language because it involves the use of all these different things, facial expressions, body postures, sounds. Taglia Latella also observed that when chimps wanted food, they seemed to use specific symbols, a seemingly crude form of sign language. He knew that in the human brain, a region called Broca's area becomes activated when humans not only speak, but use sign language as well. Were chimps employing the same part of their brain to communicate? And if so, could it give us clues on the evolutionary steps that developed language? Could the origins of our greatest evolutionary achievement be found inside the brains of chimps? Using a brain imaging device developed for humans called a PET scanner, Taglia Latella embarked on an unprecedented study. He wanted to capture 3D images of the brains of chimps as the animals gestured and called for food to see if they might have their own version of Broca's area. So this was very exciting for us because it was really the first time that anyone had looked at what was going on in the chimpanzee brain during their communication. Comparing images of human brains to chimp brains when communicating, Taglia Latella found remarkable similarities. The chimps were using a part of the brain that appeared to be in the same position as Broca's area. It's been thought that these areas that are involved in speech production, in language production, arose just in humans and probably weren't present before we split with chimpanzees. What this tells us is that maybe these parts were already used for communication, even before we had human language. And so this really changes how we think language may have evolved or how language may have come to be. Language may have its roots in a relative that our earliest ancestors split from five million years ago. But if humans and chimps share the same language center in their brains, why were humans the only species to ultimately develop language? What we still don't really know is why did humans set off on this unprecedented trajectory? Why did natural selection just keep selecting on bigger and bigger brains, three times as large as a chimpanzee's? Clearly, along the course of evolutionary time, complexity in our communication was selected for, as was increased complexity in our brain. But the real answer as to why this may have happened, we're really not sure. What could have been the pressures that led our ancestors to evolve language? Was it an adaptation for living in large numbers? A need to band together in a hostile world? For now, scientists can only speculate. For though we humans may just be on the cusp of understanding why we stand alone, in our capacity to express complex ideas, to write down our thoughts, or to reason with each other. This much is clear. 
Communication, even in its most basic of forms, provides all creatures, great and small, with a powerful strategy for survival.